All right. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Sorry, we are really crowded uh, in this meeting. Therefore, we had to mute everyone. That was the uh, problem that someone of you were uh, writing. So uh, I would like to welcome all of you uh, for uh, today's uh, semi webinar of EPMA. This is the last one uh, within uh, the program of uh, webinars of 2020 uh, and it is on hard materials. We have two very important guests. Uh, these are Jose Garcia from Sandvik and uh, Stephen Mosley from Hilti. So maybe uh, I would like to invite them to just shortly say hello to everyone. Uh, Jose and Steven, can you turn on your uh, microphone and camera and uh, just we welcome our guests? Yeah, good morning everyone or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course, we really have um, many international guests today. Uh, from, uh, a lot of, of well-known names and uh, it's, a, it's a pity we can't meet uh, in person, but uh, I know there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of friends from the academic and industrial community that we know very well here today. So welcome and also welcome to the newcomers who uh, may be new to uh, the EPMA or to hard materials, powder metallurgy in general. I uh, hope you'll enjoy the next uh, hour and a half or so. Yeah, do you have any words to say, Jose? For, from my side as well. Uh, uh, welcome everybody and thank you for the opportunity to, to for this webinar. I think it will be very interesting also for, as you mentioned, Steve, for the newcomers and for the established uh, uh, people in the community. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. You're welcome. So shortly our agenda is, uh, I will have a, a generic style uh, EPMA presentation and its activities. Uh, and then we will have uh, first Jose presenting about the theoretical background of cemented carbides and then uh, Steven will uh, present some uh, practical applications and case studies in hard materials. So let me share my screen to go on uh, with our first uh, uh, presentation uh, that I would like to make about EPMA. Okay, I'll see you soon. Yeah, <laughs> see you, bye bye. OK, uh, so I would like to say some words about uh, European Powder Metallurgy Association and its activities so far. So good. Uh, as you may know, EPMA is uh, a non-profit association uh, founded in Brussels in 1989 with key missions of promoting and developing the powder metallurgy in Europe and representing the industry in Europe and internationally and developing the future of AM. So shortly we say EPMA is what its mentor members want it to be. Regarding our uh, members, uh, we have uh, more than 300 members. Uh, most of these are corporate members. And then we have the individual members, mainly from academia and even sometimes students. Uh, as you can see, uh, if you uh, look at the uh, pie chart of the members by activity, we have part makers, uh, raw materials that is powder producers, research centers, equipment and machinery builders, uh, consultants and end users, service suppliers, etc. For the geographical distribution of our members, it is really international. Although we have the majority coming from Europe, we have other members from other European countries, USA uh, and uh, Japan, etc. Uh, so uh, we also try to be as much as international to uh, regarding the powder metallurgy industry. This is the organization chart of EPMA. Uh, we have a board and council in the top that is uh, elected in every three years. I mean, the board is elected every three years with the president and the tre treasurer. Uh, so, uh, we also have the secretariat that is the 
a permanent staff of EPMA, including me, we are nine people. And every year we have a general assembly in uh, end of March or April, and uh, all the corporate members are invited to this meeting for the decisions uh, about EPMA, either in the short term or the long term. On the other hand, the board and council has uh, meetings uh, by the end of this year. So, for example, for December, it was last week. And then we have the uh, uh, sectoral groups and working groups. Uh, we have uh, six sectoral groups and four working groups. You may already know our sectoral groups as additive manufacturing, hard materials, hot isostatic pressing, metal injection molding, structural parts, that is present center, that's a startup, let's say, of EPMA. And then we have the functional materials for the working groups. We have the environment health quality and safety working group. We have RET, the research, education and training working group. We have the EPMI. This is European Powder Metallurgy Institute. And then we have the European Communications Group. Uh, so. If we uh, summarize the history of uh, powder metallurgy like a tree uh, on the roots of the tree, we have the alloys, the materials that is our metal powders. Uh, the first and the good old one is the ferrous alloys, and then we have the hard materials. Uh, in the historical uh, sequence, now uh, we have uh, other alloys from titanium or uh, some functional materials. So step by step, starting in 1989 with the present center sectoral group, uh, a new sectoral group has been formed within EPMA uh, according to the new needs developing and new processing arising. Therefore, new sectors are being born. I think this will not uh, be, uh, there will not be an uh, end for the story. Uh, within the next few years, maybe we will see some new uh, sectors uh, being uh, on the uh, stage and new materials arising. Therefore, maybe we have new uh, topics to discuss and uh, areas to um, search on and go on working. Uh, regarding our publications and activities, uh, I would like to uh, give some words about uh, our uh, websites that you can use. So uh, regarding the EPMA seminars, you can visit seminars.epma.com. Uh, and uh, also I would like to mention at this point, especially our new global PM uh, property database. Uh, it, it is uh, being constructed um, about 20 years ago to uh, form a database for metal powders. Uh, now we have been working on it last year to uh, modernize it and develop it in the cloud uh, with a better speed and better interface. Uh, I would like to invite you to visit the database and get profit of it from PM database.com. Uh, so our next uh, area is social network, like many associations or companies. Uh, in LinkedIn, we are rather active. Uh, we have uh, more than 2,600 uh, followers of our EPMA page. And also we have a networking group uh, where we share uh, a lot of our, our activities uh, through uh, LinkedIn. Uh, also, we have our YouTube channel. Mainly we use for posting our video recordings of important events like the Congress. But of course, these are rather private uh, videos open to members of EPMA. We also have uh, a Twitter account called EuroPMA Association. You can follow all these in social media. For each important event, we also prepare a microsite. As you can see on the right side for each year or for our congresses, uh, we have a dedicated website. For example, this year it is european2021.com. 
It is still under development and I have some words to say about it within the next few slides. On the other hand, uh, as I said, you can uh, visit our PM database and we also have a design for PM page. This is also very interesting for uh, people working in the field of powder metallurgy. We also have thesis competi competitions uh, during the Congress that you can participate if you are a PhD student or uh, if you uh, are willing to do some work uh, as a philosophy degree. Regarding 2020, this is a summary of our events. For uh, the seminars, we had the present center showcase in Hari in the beginning of 2020, and then we had the HIP seminar in March in Oslo. Unfortunately, that was the last physical event. Just after this event, you know, the whole world has started going on lockdowns. Therefore, for the rest of the year, we had to keep all, all our events as virtual. As you can see, the functional materials, the Supreme Workshop AM seminar and the Present Center seminar has all been um, organized uh, virtual. Uh, and unfortunately, we will go on this way of working in 2021 also. We also had our webinars to raise awareness in powder metallurgy and actually this is the last uh, uh, webinar we will have in 2020 uh, that is on hard materials as you can see on the bottom of the slide. Uh, this is the planning for 2021. Uh, the HIP seminar in February will be virtual, that's for sure. Uh, the AM seminar, we will see. I mean, uh, we will try to keep it hybrid at least, but if it doesn't work out, uh, definitely we will go virtual for all these events listed in this slide. OK, this is a very important topic I would like to uh, announce uh, regarding European 2021. Uh, as I said last week, there was the meeting of Board and Council of EPMA and it is decided to go virtual this year again. But uh, to improve the quality of the event, there are a lot of uh, discussions like having a virtual exhibition. Uh, and to increase the networking during the event, we are working on some kind of breakout rooms that people can communicate directly as if they do in a physical meeting for networking. These will all be announced step by step uh, as we develop these. Uh, so you are kindly invited to join our Congress this year. Uh, uh, that will be held online on the dates from 17 to 20 of October. I would like to say some uh, words about our club projects. Uh, these are uh, rather uh, medium or small budget projects uh, that are organized by EPMA and the funding is done by our industry members. OK, it works like this. Uh, the project ideas from universities or research centers uh, are delivered to EPMA and EPMA organizes some calls to invite um, industrial partners to participate in the project. Uh, these partners share the financial load plus the outcomes of the project. But if we consider uh, the RD uh, work uh, costs uh, being so high and time consuming, this type of projects help to save time and money for the companies. But in the end, of course, they share the results of or the outcomes of these projects. So far, we organized 28 projects and we raised uh, more than 1 million euros in total for all these projects. You can uh, get more information from EPMA website under the projects tab. Uh, the, here are some samples I would like to short, shortly mention. Uh, in additive manufacturing, we have a, a Powder 2 project that has been just finalized and we will go probably on the third stage. Uh, we have quite a high number of club projects in hard materials. That's a very active area of <laughs> AGM sectoral group. As you can see, we have a micromechanical testing project. We have an ultrasonic fatigue testing project and we have um, a simulation of uh, fatigue crack growth in hard metals project. These are uh, actually has been running for a long time and every stage is completed. A new stage is started within uh, the scope of investing more and more on these uh, specific uh, areas. 
We also uh, participate as EPMA in EU funded projects. Uh, for example, currently we are uh, taking part in Supreme project that will be uh, finalized uh, in the beginning of 2021. And we are still a, a partner of the Erasmus project SAM. This is uh, sector skills in additive manufacturing project. Probably you see uh, sometimes uh, posts on LinkedIn about this, for example, as EPMA, we are organizing online long term courses for materials and additive manufacturing. Uh, so these will be more and more step by step as the project continues. Uh, as I said, the SAM project is a very important project uh, for us. We are uh, giving good focus on it. Uh, it is a project with 16 partners where uh, European Welding Federation is the coordinator. Uh, the total budget is uh, really high uh, and uh, the goal here is to uh, build up a certain system of uh, training and education uh, in additive manufacturing. So please be following our uh, news about SAM project through EPMA social media. So just a summary and conclusion. Uh, the powder metallurgy community is rather small, maybe in comparison to big sectors like iron and steel industry in Europe, but it's strong. I mean, that's the good news. And uh, EPMA uh, creates good synergy uh, by increasing the visibility of powder metallurgy. And uh, EPMA also works on uh, increasing the efficiency uh, with large involvement of the PM communities activities uh, in uh, our association. So shortly, PM powder metallurgy has a great uh, potential uh, to develop. It is rather lean, sustainable, cost efficient, innovative and fast. So we need each of you to help us to enforce the future of powder metallurgy. Thank you all for listening to my short presentation about EPMA. You can contact me or our team through our website, our telephones, our mails. It's open uh, all the time for any questions of, of, of yours. So now I would like to give the floor uh, to Jose Garcia. Uh, he will uh, make a very nice presentation uh, on a theoretical background of cemented carbides. Uh, I really like to learn a lot uh, and to tell the truth, I learned a lot from Jose's papers and articles. You can find all these uh, also uh, online uh, on internet. So the floor is yours, Jose. Okay, uh, do you hear me, Kenan? Yes, I hear you and your presentation is on the screen. You can go on. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody, for being here today. Uh, I will. Uh, I got, got an invitation from EPMA to to have this uh, on cemented carbide microstructures. Uh, I'm really happy to to be here. Uh, my name is Jose Garcia. Uh, I work for Sambi Coroman uh, in Sweden, uh, basically in the area of carbide and sintering. Um, so I will go through this uh, in about 25 minutes. Uh, I wish uh, you a nice uh, uh, talk. Um, so why is cemented carbide so important? I think in, in the core of the PM uh, industry is cemented carbide. Uh, and actually, if we look in the history of cemented carbide, we can say that cemented carbide hard metal is a quite new material because uh, the first pattern uh, submit about cemented carbide was in 1923. So in around three years, two years, we will have a celebration of 100 years of cemented carbide. Uh, uh, but the first uh, marketed cemented carbide, uh, which was called Vivia, because uh, at, at that moment it was a, a material which was as hard as diamond. Um, Vivia in German means Viviamant, like diamond. Uh, it was marketed by the company Group Vivia uh, in, in uh, actually in the Leipzig Spring Fair in 1927. Uh, after this, uh, the other companies uh, were actually uh, marketing cemented carbide, uh, including the companies we, we know today, uh, but basically it was a rapid growth of this material. Uh, and what is the reason for, for the rapid growth of the material? Is because of the diversity 
of applications that you have if you combine the particle size of the tungsten carbide grain size and the binder content of the cobalt in this case. So you can actually use the cemented carbide for very different applications if you are changing the particle size of the tungsten carbide and the binder content. You can focus on the use of wear parts, you can use um, composite machining and a big part is around the metal cutting machining. But you can also, for example, produce the punches for the toolings or if you are in Austria, you can use also the punch for the euro coins. Uh, of course, you know that the big market is the machine of automotive parts and the aerospace when it comes to turbine machining and uh, everything which is connected to, uh, for example, drilling. Uh, you have also the applications in the extraction, in the ores, in the mining, and also the perforation offshore. So this actually showing that just a simple combination of two phases in a composite material can give you a lot of properties regarding toughness and hardness, which are the main properties we are exploiting in this type of materials. When we were looking at uh, on these uh, cemented carbides and, and, and all the uh, possibilities you have to get this. Uh, then my colleagues uh, and uh, me decided to make a more categorization of this uh, group of materials of the cemented carbides and actually put them in a context. Uh, and I think that has been very welcome for, for, for the community. We divide actually cemented carbides in four main groups. Uh, one is connecting to the tungsten carbide morphology and chemistry. Uh, the second one connecting to the addition of cubic carbides. Uh, then we create a group which is, uh, uh, or a group of materials, and we, we select about functionally graded materials where we're collecting some kind of gradients in the structure. And then one we was focusing more on the binder design of cemented carbide, which has been always a challenge in the industry. And as you see here, this is a picture that you can find in this uh, article, which is open access. So everybody can uh, look upon this, and there is a very a good, I think, in my opinion, description of each microstructure and with some nice pictures. So my presentation today will be based on, on this approach, on this description, and uh, because of a lack of time, I cannot present all of microstructures, but I have selected the most uh, yeah, trendy ones, we can say, uh, and that's uh, what we're going to do today. So and let's start with the tungsten carbide cobalt system. And uh, I must say, uh, tungsten carbide cobalt, here we are looking at a very nice uh, 3D tomography from a group of UPC of Luis Janes, and this is a work published by, by Jimenez Piquet in 2017, when actually they, when they did a very nice tomography of this material, uh, and they cut this in slices and they did a reconstruction. And basically what you see here is uh, something which is very interesting. We are talking here about, for those who are new in this uh, area, Tungsten carbide grains you see here, these are the faceted grains and the dark face here is the cobalt binder. So the combination of the composite material is about the hardness or intrinsic hardness of the tungsten carbide particle size, which are forming a carbon skeleton, which is really visible here. This is the blue one, but you, they are embedded in a cobalt matrix binder. So if you remove the tungsten carbide grains, you will have the cobalt binder here and you have an interconnectivity between these, which is giving a kind of a skeleton. And the strengths of the material and the capability of the material of the basic concept of the tungsten carbide core and cemented carbide is the controlling the tungsten carbide particle size and the volume fraction of binder, and by this controlling the interfaces and the strengths of the material. Um, a way of improving the properties, if we would say, okay, we are always in the cemented carbide, and I think in many, many applications when you need to combine uh, strengths. Uh, but also you need to have toughness. Then, uh, of course, we measure the hardness by beakers uh, as a function of the cobalt in this case for different sizes of tungsten carbide grains. And you see actually that, for example, for the same amount of binder content, we will locate at five, you can have three different harnesses depending on the size of the tank, uh, depending on the size of the tungsten carbide uh, grain size. Uh, exactly. And by this, you can shop between uh, tungsten carbide, binder, different type of combinations that give you what we call edge line toughness, which is a very important property in machining, or bulk toughness, which is also a very good property in mining application, for example, or you get the extreme hardness that you may need, for example, in a wear part. 
or for example, some thermal conductivity if it may be needed. All these variations come upon controlling these um, variables. Interesting is that from coming from a, to a fine grain material, which is actually a way of maximizing the strength, is by reducing the particle size and making the material more resistant to the formation. And you see here, this is a comparison. Here you have the same line, length scales, you have five micrometers. On one side, you have what we call a, yeah, a medium grain. Uh, and here you have a fine grain material. And you see that the immediately at the tungsten carbide uh, particle size is much smaller than this one. Uh, and the way to do this is technically feasible uh, by adding some kinds of inhibitors. Uh, and the reason is that when we are producing this type of cemented carbides, they are producing by liquid phase sintering. So actually what you are making, you are taking a portion of tungsten carbide uh, powder, mixing with a portion of uh, cobalt powder, and making a milling process, and then sintering, pressing of course, and sintering it. And during the sintering, you will have the formation of a liquid phase, and then you will have actually transport of carbon, tungsten elements to form the uh, skeleton. Uh, and of course, there is a strong driving force for small particles to grow because this is a way of minimizing the energy. Uh, but the way to do this, to avoid this, is by adding some kinds of inhibitors. And these inhibitors, as you see, uh, these uh, carbides that you can add may control the uh, particle size of the tungsten carbide grain. The question is that uh, depending on how much you are adding of them, and you see that some of them are more powerful than others, you see, for example, here you have a zirconium carbide uh, compared, for example, to a vanadium carbide, and you see that the strong effect of the vanadium carbide inhibition in the particle size is uh, larger than zirconium carbide, but you have others, for example, like chromium, like titanium, that may also be very potent, potent in this, uh, in this uh, achievement of fine grain structure. How this process is taking part has been studied and actually what people have found out, and this is a very nice uh, TM presentation or a picture from Sabine Ley, uh, what you see actually that the grain growth inhibitor elements, vanadium, they are acting at the interfaces of the tungsten carbide grains, producing like a kind of trapping and producing the grain growth during the liquid phase sintering. Uh, more recently, for example, in the system when we are adding chromium, and we are matching, for example, in a tungsten carbide, cobalt tungsten carbide, and measuring with uh, very high resolution. The concentration of the elements we see here, for example, that at the interface between the tungsten carbide grain and the cobalt binder, we see an increment of the chromium peak at the interface, meaning that the chromium will basically, as the vanadium carbide, act at the interface producing an enrichment of this phase and also uh, by this the uh, uh, yeah, inhibiting effect in the grain growth of the tungsten carbide phase. So this is technically the stand today in order to control this type of uh, microstructure and produce the fine grade tungsten carbide cobalt materials. Of course we can play around and we can also create some kind of B-model tungsten carbide grains and distribution this is an extreme case, but it's a very nice picture uh, of a material we produce. Uh, well, you can see that we have a combination of fine grain particles and uh, larger tungsten carbide grains. They are actually the same two components, but here we are playing around with the way of using it in order to get a B-model distribution of tungsten carbide grains. Some people uh, are claiming, and I think it's visible, that by doing this type of combination of large and small particle size of tungsten carbide grains, then you can get enhanced toughness due to a more tortuosity in the crack uh, uh, propagation during fracture. Uh, and I think this is, uh, sorry, and this is also visible uh, in this publication where actually same type of microstructures uh, but with different tungsten carbide size distributions were compared uh, showing the advantage of having this type of technical uh, uh, microstructure development. Another way of tailoring the properties here of the tungsten carbide cobalt system is now to change the type of tungsten carbide I'm using. Um, basically, uh, it's adding some type of element in the tungsten carbide 
uh, grains as a solid solution uh, just to change the properties of the tungsten carbide and by this the general uh, property of the uh, tungsten carbide uh, a mixture. And here you see this is also a very nice uh, work uh, where we see actually uh, tungsten carbide grains that has been doped with, in this case I think it was tantalum and you see that if you make an atom probe tomography on this you take each atom of the tungsten carbide grain of one of these grains you will see that you have this here violet face is the tantalum uh, the tantalum atoms uh, basically that are distributed homogeneously in the tungsten carbide grain by this Jose, you are muted. Jose, do you hear me? Uh, Jose, do you hear me? Sorry, yes. Yeah, you were muted. I mean, uh, I don't know what happened, but suddenly you were muted. I think uh, somebody muted me because maybe uh, I'm trying to check it, uh, trying to prevent it, but it happens sometimes. Sorry for that. Can yeah. you please continue from the uh, point you left? It was this slide, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I continue here. Sorry please. for this. No, no yeah. problem. No problem. That happens in live events all the time. Yeah. So please uh, share the screen. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, start the presentation and go on. You can yeah, go thank on. You. Thank you. Okay. So again, uh, here I'm back. Uh, sorry for this. Somebody muted me. Uh, no, I, I was talking here about the uh, doping of the tungsten carbide uh, grains. And by this, uh, we can change locally the property of uh, single tungsten carbide grains and uh, in the general properties of the uh, composite. And here actually you see, I mean, we have done uh, the doping of the tungsten carbide with tantalon. And if we are collecting the information here by atom probe tomography, we can see that we have the distribution of homogeneous element tantalon inside of the tungsten carbide grains. This will affect also the local properties of the tungsten carbides, and that has been measured uh, by <coughs> uh, that has been measured by uh, nano hardness, where you see that the uh, that the hardness that the hardness of the tungsten carbide uh, grain change uh, uh, locally and also the E-module uh, by adding, for example, in this case, tantalon, it's making it a little bit yeah, less hard, we can say, compared to the undock situation. And this is actually uh, one thing that could also be used to tailor the properties locally of the material. Um, another way of <coughs> uh, looking into this is, for example, by uh, changing the morphology of the tungsten carbide grains. And here you have, uh, for example, a platelet tungsten carbide grain. Uh, it's, uh, here is a very wonderful uh, image uh, of 3D. I think it's SEM, where well, actually you see that the morphology of the tungsten carbide grain can be changed locally uh, by adding some inhibitors, by uh, avoiding the grain growth of the uh, crystallite of tungsten carbide in certain direction by doping it uh, properly. Uh, and in this case, you get this uh, trigonal symmetry or truncated symmetry, but only uh, in restricted planes, creating this type of effect, which is also visible in the image on the left. Uh, this platelet tungsten carbide, again, if we are talking about a uh, combination of hardness and toughness, can give also a difficult path for tortuosity, for the <coughs> actually uh, yeah, propagation of a crack, meaning that you could have a different type of hardness to toughness behavior uh, that are expected just by the simple composition, which is actually of potential interest for uh, different applications. Uh, we are uh, jumping now to the second uh, uh, type of material. In this case, we are actually the second group is including what we call the gamma phase. And the gamma phase are cubic carbides that are added, in this case, titanium carbide, tantalum carbide, niobium carbide, and they will produce a second phase. So here, what you see here, you see the tungsten carbide grains are the white phase here, you, you see the gamma phase here, and the dark one is, the, in this case, the cobalt phase. Uh, and this is an ACM image from the top where we have H the binder phase, where you see actually the different morphology between the tungsten carbide grains and the cubic carbide gamma phase. 
Uh, and this is very important because uh, this can also be used in order to increase the hardness in the material, for example, and was used much in the past when before the, the use of the coatings extensively because it was a way of having actually a better wear resistance in, for example, turning applications. Today, if we compare the past and today, today we see that the volume fraction of this gamma phase is less because of the use of the coatings and also because of the a combination of hardness and toughness necessary in the material. What you see here is a light optical microscopy, but you see, I mean, again, it's very easy to distinguish the tungsten carbide grains. It's the gray phase, you have the white phase, the cobalt, and the gamma phase, the brownish one. Uh, it is important also to say this is a just just picture without any coloring. So uh, cement carbide, in this sense, they are also nice that they can have also these kind of nice colors depending on composition. Dear Jose. Yes. Uh, can you please uh, maximize the screen because uh, we see the uh, control bar and cannot read. Oh, uh, yeah. Can you go? Yeah, can you click on this? I uh, know. Maybe you stop and share once again because the problem is we see on the bottom. Uh, ah, yeah. Hidden. I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I see the problem. Yeah. You can stop sharing and start once again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me do this again. Uh, Yes, now, now it's back. Oh yes, we can read the bottom side. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Please go Thank on. You. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, what I was saying uh, again, I, I think that uh, the colors here are not painted, and you see here these are the the typical uh, titanium nitride carbide and, and car, uh, that are used in order to change the properties locally and or or in general of the material. And you have here the titanium carbide usually is used for the hardness and the tantal niobium carbide for the hot hardness and thermal shock resistance. Um, in case of adding a lot of <laughs> cubic carbides is uh, jumping into the cermets in, and the cermets here, the, the particular microstructure because they have a combination uh, or, or a, what is called a corium structure where actually you have undissolved uh, hard grains on the core uh, surrounded by, for example, a rim, which is uh, uh, actually made of the same components, but uh, surrounding these uh, 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 coarse uh, grains. Uh, this is a very nice description that was done by Klaus Dreyer, a frame, uh, a common frame from, from Vivia at that time, uh, where actually he described the cement carbide, the hard metal in this case, this is German, but it's easy to understand. You see you have here gamma phase and you have tungsten carbide grains, but if you increase the volume fraction of this phase, then suddenly the, the tungsten carbide will be allocated in the core structure and you will not have the hexagonal grain, grains uh, of the tungsten carbide. And this is basically the definition from jumping from a gamma phase containing cemetery carbide to a cement, which is actually uh, very uh, crucial because here, due to the high content of cubic carbides, then you, you will have this core structure you will have actually cermets which are very hard, uh, but they have the uh, low toughness, so they are using mostly for finishing operations where you don't have interrupting machining and the problem of toughness. Uh, one also interesting case that's happening in the last year is the use of uh, niobium carbide uh, cermets uh, due to, yeah, uh, some resources they have in Brazil, uh, big sources of niobium carbide, so we are switching now and changing and pulling actually niobium carbide as the phase instead of tungsten carbide. Uh, you see that this is very particular here because you get this type of rounded faces, but also it has been shown that by, by doping it with tungsten carbide, with other type of uh, metals, you can also jump into other type of microstructure. You can even get a corium structure, and if you are adding a lot of tungsten carbide, also you can get a secondary phase like a small tungsten carbide grains here. Uh, so very interesting, actually, in terms of hardness and toughness, they, they are uh, also attractive. They have some drawbacks, but they have been studied lately. That is, is the way they, they have the, the crack and, uh, and the fracture. And, and usually uh, the, the transgranular fracture is not desirable. We would like to have more an intergranular fracture uh, where you have actually this yeah, binder phase dumplings, which are actually uh, yeah, fracturing. Uh, and the forming uh, and, and this type of, uh, of behavior has been studied and actually depending on composition you can get also this type of, of, of behavior which is more desirable. So I think here there is 
also potential to understand this uh, and to use the material. Mm, I don't know as a cutting material, but as a wear part uh, and other type of applications can be also very, very interesting. We are jumping now to the third group. Now we are talking about gradients, and you know that that is also very interesting in this cement carbide. That depending on the way you are mixturing and, and sintering, you can also produce gradients locally in situ. Uh, and I think this has been exploited uh, by years, uh, basically with this initial work of uh, Nemes and Graf uh, and others uh, in US. But actually. Uh, the idea here is that you combine toughness and, and hardness. And as you remember from the first description, uh, adding the cubic carbides will increase the hardness of the material, uh, but sometimes we need the toughness. And the toughness is done by getting rid of the uh, cubic carbide uh, on the surface uh, and producing enrichment of the cubic carbides at the tip and the cutting edge. And this is done uh, by adding some nitride in the composition, some carbon nitride, so we are getting a nitrogen containing gamma phase. When we are sintering in vacuum, then we are releasing nitrogen. And due to the coupling of the titanium tantalum niobe with the nitrogen, we will have an effect of indiffusion of this, a dissolution here of the uh, nitrogen containing gamma phase uh, and some movement of the cobalt to balance the system. And that has been described very nicely in this uh, PhD by Schwarzkopf and some publications creating a system which has actually this gradient structure. And then if you see, if we take this, now it says SEM image is the same. And now we are plotting the titanium content and the cobalt content, uh, plotting actually measuring the, the element distribution as a function of the depth. You see here that you have a titanium content which is missing here in the gamma phase free gradient and increase of the cobalt content. Uh, producing this type of behavior in terms of harness and as a function of depth. Well, you see actually that the harness is uh, less here in the uh, gradient part and higher in the bulk. And also you see that the cobalt concentration in this case is less here and increasing here with the sharp interface. So here we have a combination of toughness and harness in the same material producing C2 during sintering. Another way of making this type of gradient is instead of getting rid of the nitrogen is to add nitrogen. If you have actually a cubic carbide, cemented carbide, you can add a lot of nitrogen and produce a nitridation and reach a layer here. Uh, and that has been also in combination with some coatings have shown the potential to have like a kind of two layers of wear resistance. One provided by the coating itself uh, and one provided by the enrichment due to the nitridation process. Uh, which is visible in this comparison, uh, especially in this two one. Here you have the cemented carbide, the blue one is without the nitridation layer. And here you have the same system, the green one, where you have actually two steps. You have one, you need to get rid of the carbon nitride where, and then you need to actually have the cubic carbide layer. And take a look, that is a logarithmic scale. So the improvement between the green one and the and blue one is uh, considerable high. Uh, one of also most famous uh, uh, <coughs> gradient system is the, what we call the uh, DP carbide, the dual properties carbide. And in this case, it's starting from an under stoichiometric cemented carbide with some uh, eta phase presenting and making a carbonization process. Uh, and by doing this, uh, it is possible to create three layers, uh, cemented carbide, one with the a starting core structure, and then due to the, the carbon diffusion, you can on once dissolve the eta phase that is present here, the, the substoichiometric phase, uh, which is present on the surface, and then in between you will have also a kind of transport effect, which will create uh, enrichment of cobalt on the interface. Uh, and this uh, type of material create also a kind of uh, dual property a condition where you have increased hardness on the surface combined with a high toughness in the interface and an appropriate hardness on the bulk um, and is used in the rock drill buttons uh, uh, from Sandvik and others uh, based on this uh, famous pattern by Fisher, Hartzell and Okema. Uh, we also have tried to do other type of gradients, uh, for example this is here, I see some 
usually in the image, but it's combining two different tungsten carbide particle size. So you can press one and other with different particle size and, and condense, condense them and center them in one piece, and you will have this type of gradient uh, of particles, uh, which can also provide hardness and toughness in one single component. There are others, for example, that have tried to do the same by uh, creating uh, different interfaces because there will be here a problem when we are doing this type or a cha challenge that can be used for a positive or not way is the transfer of cobalt that will take place from one part to the other because there will be like a kind of <coughs> uh, transport effect from the cobalt from the larger particles into the small particles like a kind of capillarity effect and also it's very important to have a control of the carbon here because the carbon will also be a driving force for movement of the binder phase and on top of this you will have also the cobalt itself volume fraction we will try to equalize so creating this type of sharp uh, gradients uh, in particle size and binder content is a challenge that actually has been exploited uh, and shown but uh, yeah it requires a very careful uh, processing uh, method we are coming now to the last group of material, and these are the alternative binders materials. And I think they are very, very interesting because there are some needs in some areas or thoughts to replace cobalt. Uh, and for these, the candidates, most common candidates are iron and nickel, which are actually very close in the periodic system and also feasible of achieving cemented carbide microstructure. At least they look like cemented carbide when you center them and you polish but we will see that actually properties differ from the standard tungsten carbide cobalt to the tungsten carbide iron and nickel. And finding combination between iron and nickel that are suitable are actually a challenge. Uh, and this is basically due to the intrinsic properties of the cobalt. Cobalt possesses actually like a kind of work hardening effect that makes it suitable for uh, yeah, applications where you have high strength. Uh, to, to a low stacking fall energy, uh, something that's not happening in the nickel, which has a higher stacking fall energy. And in the case of iron, actually there is a tendency to uh, create very hard structures. So the combination balance between them is a challenge. Uh, I, I am showing this work from 2002, uh, a comparison between the microstructure. You see actually you get the tungsten carbide cobalt, the tungsten carbide iron and the nickel, this was for the same volume fraction of binder and you see that they differ in the grain growth. Uh, and more lately, he was a, a PhD student working in cooperation with us that actually did a fantastic work. Um, um, where actually you see that the grain growth uh, of the tungsten carbide cobalt, tungsten carbide and tungsten carbide nickel differs. Uh, there is a different mechanism that makes them, uh, yeah, growth in different in different uh, stages, we can say, and this is also affecting the skeleton and also the structures. So you have actually on one hand the difference in the binder properties themselves, but also you do have a difference in the type of uh, grain growth and in the type of uh, skeleton you are forming when you are uh, sintering these uh, different structures. Uh, the high entropy alloys is a hot topic. People are talking a lot about this and there are a lot of work on this. I show internal work we have on the high entropy alloys, where actually you see that you can produce these multi-component alloys in cemented carbides, where you have actually, uh, for example, uh, tungsten carbide, chromium carbide, vanadium carbide, uh, whatever carbide, in, uh, and then you can get a combination of them to maximize strength. Uh, and uh, and this uh, has been proven to be very effective in applications where you need actually high strength even machining, uh, but there's still a challenge when it comes to toughness in this type of applications. So uh, it's a actually very interesting topic, uh, and I think uh, uh, I'm expecting in the future to have more, more, more uh, microstructures uh, which are suitable for machining in this system. Uh, I would like also to show uh, one of the final slides when it comes to alumina binders. Uh, I think they are also potential here. Uh, we are talking about iron alumina, nickel alumina. Uh, you see that some people are showing here that they can produce uh, nickel aluminium uh, gamma prime precipitates in a binder phase. 
there has been also some recently work from, from SAID on this. I think they are uh, very interesting to follow. But basically here we are aiming at increasing the strength at high temperature. And, and to come to this, uh, overcome the problem that <coughs> replacing cobalt has in terms of properties at, at high temperatures. I think the one point is that usually if we measure at room temperatures, we cannot extrapolate what will happen at high temperatures. And it's important that we know that the system can also withstand uh, the formation of, uh, in the application. And I think Steve Mosley will talk about this. Just to show one example, that is actually a plant's work from 1985. Oh, no, it's yeah, hard materials conference 85. What you see here, uh, nickel, aluminum, chromium, hard alloy. You have here the nickel aluminum containing. This is the hardness as a function of temperature. And here is in the cobalt system. Uh, or in the nickel system without the aluminum addition, and you see the difference actually is uh, quite remarkable in terms of strength. So, and by this, uh, I think uh, I'm finalizing my uh, talk today uh, and just say thank you very much to everybody. Uh, I invite you to look into the uh, paper if you like to hear. It's a nice picture, it's in the cold Sweden <laughs> some years ago. Uh, here is Veronica, uh, our colleague in the department. Uh, Bartek, uh, also a former colleague, now working as R&D manager in another organization, and Anden Blomquist, uh, my dear friend, also who helped me to put this work together. Thank you very much uh, to everybody for uh, your attention. We thank you, Jose. This was really a nice presentation uh, about cemented carbide. We have a few questions before going on to Steven. I would like to ask them uh, yeah. shortly. The first one is from Andoni. Uh, yeah. He asks why some of the carbides show angular shapes, for example, tungsten carbide, while other hard materials such as niobium carbide or titanium carbide, carbide show a more rounded shape. Yeah, I think uh, one one uh, answer we have to this is that actually what is happening at the interfacial energies in order to minimize uh, the energy at the interface and. Uh, basically, uh, that's uh, w w and the, you have also the weighting involved. So basically, it's common in this system that the tungsten carbide grain get the hexagonal phase. Uh, I mean, this uh, particular uh, shape, uh, uh, pre uh, which is the truncated prismatic uh, uh, phase, but it's not happening in the in the cubic carbide uh, phase, which is actually more uh, rounded. Uh, I think it's connected to interfacial energies uh, in the system. Yeah. Okay, so there was a second question. Actually, it is is kind of answered. This is from Hozik. When we have liquid phase sintering, won't the sharp angular shape become smooth due to solution reprecipitation in the liquid phase? Uh, yeah, there are works on grain growth of cement carbide. So, uh, but basically, uh, I didn't understand exactly the question, but I think it's uh, it's about the growth. The uh, type we have in the tank and carbide grains, uh, making the yeah the form the, this uh, particular shape of the tank and carbide grain. Okay, uh, I think that's all. Uh, and also in the end, if you have some more questions, we can come back to this uh, discussion of uh, cemented carbides and go on our questions. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Stephen Mosley to stage to go on with his presentation on applications. Thank you, Jose, once again. Thank so, you. hello, Steven. <laughs> yeah. Can oh, you stop sharing the screen, Jose? Oh, yeah, okay. Thank yeah, you. I will Good. do it. Yeah. 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 Oh, they're so, so fast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Steven, the time is yours. Uh, we would like to hear from you about applications of hard materials. Okay, can you see my screen? One of the most famous questions of the last nine months. Yes, now you started the presentation and it seems running smoothly. You can go okay. on, thank you. You can see it in full screen, that's good. Yes, All of course. Right. Okay, so uh, welcome to the second part, uh, or in fact the third part, but the second technical part of this uh, webinar. And uh, I'd just like to correct one thing at the beginning. I'm not, if I was the chief scientist for Hilti, I'd be a much richer man than I am. Uh, I'm actually just responsible for the area that is called hard materials and insert tools. Um, group key expert uh, for uh, the manufacture of uh, hard material containing components. Uh, and it is a shame that we can't be together uh, like we were uh, last year. Uh, at some point we will all meet again and uh, I really look forward to that day. 
So according to the EVMA, and we talked about LinkedIn earlier, um, we're going to be getting a remarkable presentation, apparently. Uh, we're going to be getting some interesting case studies uh, from different industries, and it will be a comprehensive overview. Well, let me tell you now before we start, um, you know, it's putting me a lot under pressure. Uh, because generally, if you want to take two out of three, uh, you're fine. You can either have something of high quality at high cost, uh, or uh, it'll take a long time to get the high quality, and so on and so forth. So in this case, because the time is fixed, the cost is fixed, you didn't have to pay for this, uh, you're going to have to uh, wonder about what the quality is going to be like. So if you expect a nice straight line through uh, the applications of hard metal, and hard materials, um, you're probably going to be a bit disappointed. The reality is I'll take you on a little joyride uh, through uh, a series of uh, colourful images. And when I came up with the concept for this, I, I remembered uh, what I was like when I was growing up and, and interested in something I didn't know anything about. You'd pick up books like these, uh, which basically give you some nice colourful images, a little bit of text and, and all the information you need. And I think 40 years later in the internet generation, uh, where you know people are transient and move on from one thing to another very quickly and just want the facts in a, in a nutshell. Uh, this sort of style of presentation is probably going to come back more into fashion. So what you'll get from me today is basically uh, lots of pictures, a few graphs, and I promise uh, no equations. So in this case, what we're going to see, and I'm going to go through it like this, there is a cutting tool on the left hand side. Uh, removing material in a turning operation. And on the right hand side, you've got some very nice um, coloured steel uh, with some pressed, brazed, or shrink fitted uh, cemented carbide inserts uh, that have been painted black and or they could potentially be diamond. So that's what I'm going to go through today with you. And what I hope that you will do for, for me for the next 27, 28 minutes is give me your undivided attention. Um, if you're not interested, you needn't be here. There's no point wasting your own time. Uh, so keep calm, sit down, and enjoy, mute the phones. Stop sending emails. People are not very good at, uh, at multitasking, uh, whatever they say. So just relax, put your feet up, and sit with me uh, for the next 25 minutes or so. So the, the serious part of this uh, of this is um, an introduction um, to hard materials, uh, some case studies, and uh, looking then at, uh, towards the end, obviously, with the acknowledgements uh, for this. Oops, my apologies. I seem to have lost my screen. There we go. So basically, uh, modern life depends on materials and uh, depending on who you who you Google, who, how you search it, you'll find pictures like this to say, well, yes, the most important thing in the world is it's steel, it's semiconductors, it's plastics, it's, it's whatever. Uh, the reality is that it's hard materials that have really changed the world and, and modern life depends on, on these materials. Just a moment. Sorry, I'm having some technical issues here. Uh, if you want, you can start, stop, and restart uh, sharing. This happens sometimes, Stephen. It's okay. Can you can you see the uh, the slide with the modern life depends on hard materials? Uh, we see hard materials really have changed the world. And, okay, that's good, and it's back again. Sorry, I lost my second screen for a while. I was working in the dark. Uh, okay, so if we look at uh, where where the materials are are being used, and this is one of the uh, the things we'll come to in some later pictures. Uh, to do with anything to do with, with wood machining, metal machining, metal forming, um, uh, wear resistant parts, uh, all, the, all the electronics that you use uh, require these printed circuit board drills and so on and so forth. Basically hidden behind every manufactured product, uh, there is a hard material that's been used in its manufacture. And what effect have they had? If we, if we look, this is a scale um, of uh, 1920 to 2020 is literally the last 100 years uh, about um, industrial production. And this is a measure of basically how much stuff the world is making. Uh, and it's increased by a factor of 20 in 100 years. And that's, of course, not proportional to population. 
so, so what has happened? I mean, we've increased output in, in manufacturing, in mining, in the energy we use significantly. And just to go back to, to what Jose said about the introduction of hard materials, the first arrow on the left uh, shows when, when the material was invented. Um, the, the lighter grey arrow is when the first companies started to manufacture it uh, outside of the, the video, video company. And really the, the big explosion came after the Second World War in the, 19, in the late, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, where the technology and some of the secrets of the German industry were actually then trans, uh, transported around the world and hard metal production really took off. And, and this productivity really is due to machinery uh, automation using these hard materials. Uh, people are not any more productive than they were. Uh, this again is a 100 year trend of, uh, of the productivity of people. And uh, you know, every year the people on, on average are getting a little bit more productive themselves due to these aids, due to everything else. But generally the person has not changed. It, it's the, the technology behind them uh, that is uh, increasing. And a lot of this is really dependent on the hard materials. Uh, hard materials is a key enabling technology. I'll skip that because of time. But the, the point is, if you looked around you, and these are just um, a couple of examples I've used for, for teaching purposes uh, in the past, then it's just my kitchen and my car. Uh, everything that, uh, that is in the kitchen, uh, on it, under it, um, and is used in it, uh, relies on cementic carbide. So all, all the tins we, we saw about the canning tiles, uh, anything that has a, a motor in it or, or, or requires uh, electricity generation with the white goods, your aluminium foil, your bricks, your plastics, your, uh, your pipes, the screws and nails, everything relies on it. And, and it's a similar uh, thing in the car. And, and this, these lists are, are nowhere near exhaustive there. If I, if I did uh, a real in-depth study, I could probably increase these uh, by, by you know, two, three, four times in terms of the, the areas in which these hard materials are used. So it's, it's an extremely important um, field of materials and it has an unbelievable uh, impact on uh, the, uh, the lifestyle that we have today. Uh, so yeah, sorry for that, uh, took on a little diversion. I'll get us back on track now with uh, going into this field of hard materials. So depending on who you talk to and our, our friends at the International Journal of Refractory Metals and Hard Materials define hard as 10 gigapascals, I like to think of it and the European Hard Materials Group thinks it is a little bit softer than that because there are cemented carbides and, and uh, metal matrix composites and, and the high alloy steels and tool steels and, and so on that are lower in hardness but would still class as a hard material. So we, we're looking at 8 gigapascals up to 120 gigapascals in strength for the highest um, uh, crystalline facets of diamond. And, it, and there are huge numbers of families. And again, uh, families of hard materials, again, this is not uh, an extensive list. Uh, we'll talk about uh, cemented carbides and, uh, and the diamond tools more than we will some of the others. But uh, I won't, uh, uh, just don't forget that there are also important sectors, engineering, ceramics, hard facings, we heard about the coatings and so on that, that also uh, make this field of material so interesting, so, so variable in, in its uh, applications and so important generally. So let's start some case studies. Um, I will focus on stone working. Um, it's an area that I do more, most of my work in, so it's, it's my area of greater expertise, if you like. Uh, but I'll, I will touch on, on metal cutting and, uh, and wear resistant and wear parts uh, as well. So with metal cutting, as we saw, you were talking generally about one or more of these family of cemented carbides and, and cermats, and generally with, uh, with coatings. I mean, the, the majority, the vast majority uh, of these cutting tools now are, are coated. Uh, but tool steels, engineering ceramics, polycrystalline cubic boron nitride, uh, monocrystalline boronitride and uh, diamond for grinding, for example, polycrystalline diamond cutters, all are used as cutting tools and all have their own niche and all have their own importance um, and applications where the other materials don't work. And, and if we look at these, these inserts, um, these basically uh, are your sort of classic uh, selection of potpourri of, uh, of different cutting inserts with different coatings on. Uh, one of the, the very first coatings was the titanium nitride, and people still like to see these gold coatings uh, on, on the cutting inserts, and generally it's just a top coat, 
uh, for optical purposes, although it still has some function. So we have coated inserts. Uh, in, as I said, in, in some rare cases, we're still using uncoated ones. And, and um, these are called indexable inserts. In other words, you can turn them around. Uh, when a cutting edge is worn, you move on to the next one. You can even flip them over. And there are, there are some which maybe have uh, even 8, 12, 16 uh, cutting edges. Or the circular ones, you can just uh, index by a few degrees every time and use the entire circumference uh, of the cutter uh, before it's then worn out. Generally, of course, you'll only be using a few percent at most of the actual material, if that. Uh, the rest of it is there for the structural strength. And on the bottom right, as I mentioned, different um, ceramics and, uh, and tipped uh, indexable inserts where you may want to use a, a large piece of polycrystalline super hard material. Uh, generally, though, uh, you put in little inserts in the corners uh, and just use the functional material, the expensive functional material where you need it. And all industries rely on the cutting tools. I showed the, the, the kitchen and the car, but of course, everywhere, everything we fly in, we drive in, all the energy we use. Uh, today, even, of course, uh, the manufacturing of, uh, of uh, body, part, uh, body replacement part inserts uh, and uh, prosthetics and so on, they're all, they're all machined, of course. Uh, and in power generation, uh, some of these, the, this is not a little motor, uh, like the one on the right. Uh, these things are meters in size, and of course, all these parts have to be somehow forged, machined. Uh, so it, it goes from the small to the large uh, and from uh, all industries. So if you spotted that the first time, by the way, congratulations, you are awake. And metal cutting itself is, is a multitude of operations. I mean, if we, if we can go through the turning, we've already seen the parting, the threading. Uh, milling, drilling, reaming, and I hope it's not too boring for you already. Uh, all these operations and more uh, in all these different work pieces, cast iron, steels, uh, non-ferrous metals, um, composites, wh whatever, you know, you, you name it, if it's made of something, generally you'll have to somehow machine it and, and form it. And that's where these cutting tools come into their element. Uh, it's all about subtractive manufacturing, so just go back. Uh, we, this, these cutting tools, they are subtractive manufacturing. Subtractive was here a long time before additive. And I thought maybe for, for Jose, and I know there are people in the call that are working on additive manufacturing of, uh, of hard materials, uh, maybe we can put in another class of materials, which is the AM parts, either the fusion-based or the, uh, the powder, um, sort of glue and sinter, if you like, uh, processes. Uh, where you get some very, very strange microstructures through fusion, uh, not generally suitable uh, for the application. Uh, although things are getting better, the, the fused filament, now you can actually print them without the cavities in them. You can make the, uh, the binder jetting or the solvent granule type um, systems with, with, a, with a higher green density, so you don't get these voids that then fill with the liquid cobalt during, during sintering. And if you, if you hip them, you can generally get a dense core uh, but there is still a, a bit of an issue with uh, within the surface. Uh, we talked about cobalt migration uh, and the post-processing of some of these uh, parts actually pumps the cobalt into the center and leaves a, uh, a, a less than ideal su uh, surface. So maybe that's the next one, an atlas of AM microstructures uh, and a, a nice review of that. Back to metal cutting, it's, uh, we call it a hot topic, it's pushing materials to their limits and uh, I won't dwell on this, but basically the, the type of chip that is formed, I mean you can see the oxidation actually on the workpiece uh, chip itself and you can imagine what's happening at that cutting edge and, and temperatures of six, seven, eight hundred degrees or even more uh, can be very common and that's again what Jose was saying about the use of things like these high temperature resistant uh, binders whether it's a high entropy alloy or an intermetallic precipitation uh, hardened binder. And these wear mechanisms, there are a multitude. I didn't like this slide when I put it together, so what I'll do, I'll just skip over it to a very simple uh, pictorial uh, view. There are a multitude of wear mechanisms, uh, whether they are uh, mechanical or chemical or thermal. Um, these parts have to resist a, an enormous um, high stress uh, and, and thermal collective, if you like. 
Uh, and it's also, in, in many cases, it's cyclic as well. So it's, it's not just a static load, it's a dynamic load. It's not just a high temperature, it's a constantly cycling temperature. Uh, it's, it's not just um, abrasive where it's, it's basically the material being dissolved away by the workpiece as well. Tungsten carbide particularly uh, is relatively soluble in, in IM. And, 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 and it's, uh, there's a lot of science, a lot of uh, technology, a lot of chemistry in, uh, in, in the, uh, these parts. And the coatings uh, are absolutely essential. Um, I'll just uh, just show this. I'll skip over the uh, the next one. But basically, physical vapor deposition, chemical vapor deposition uh, of a hard and relatively thin, although they can be much thicker, relatively thin uh, functional coating uh, increases the lifetime, or in fact, in many cases, means that you can use the insert in the op operation, where generally the uncoated material would, would fail uh, extremely quickly. So it's an, a very important part. It's the system, it's the workpiece, it's the substrate and the geometry, and it's the coating, and all three together uh, mean you can have this uh, high uh, productivity in, 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 in subtractive manufacturing that uh, would not be possible otherwise. So wear resistant parts, um, as I said, anywhere that you have things that are made of materials, uh, you've had hard materials somewhere in the background. And it's this sort of part, it's metal forming, it's drawing, it's uh, for the hot forming, uh, cold forming, forging, as a couple of examples. Uh, often shrink fitted uh, into steel to support the material, to allow them to have stresses acting that uh, there are no other bulk materials on earth that could actually do it. Uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit of later on about pushing a material to its limit. Uh, and that really is the case, particularly with, with cemented carbides with some of these applications. And uh, these wear resistant parts, and you'll notice the, uh, the, the flip between wear parts and wear resistant parts. We don't want them to wear, we know they will wear, but uh, they are really wear resistant parts, just that uh, with us in, in the industry, we tend to just shorten that word to wear parts. And there are again a few more, few more examples, some extreme ones such as Things like water jet cutting, where an abrasive uh, uh, particle or uh, uh, abrasive uh, medium uh, in, in a high pressure was shot out of these nozzles to actually physically cut through steels and, and metals um, as an alternative, for example, to, to laser cutting. And, and these things are, are uh, effectively almost binderless uh, cemented carbides, or they can't even be diamond. Um, all the, the big thing at the moment, of course, the sustainability, the circularity, recycling, uh, we couldn't do it without these, these sort of materials. To actually make the synthetic diamonds that do some of the work, we actually need cemented carbides in high pressure tools. Uh, and, and, and. So whole ranges of, um, of examples of where these materials are used and a couple of others, and I won't dwell on this. What I will work, I will do now, I'll take this as a lead into uh, the stone working, or stone working as I just uh, noticed a spelling mistake, um, into the stone working area, which I think is, uh, I'll say, a bit more um, colorful for you. Um, and we're talking about basically anything to do with uh, removing uh, natural uh, or mineralic materials whether it's a, a 19 millimeter drill bit for uh, bolting in the tunnel or the 19 meter uh, tunnel boring machine that actually made the hole in the first place. So uh, orders of magnitude and scale uh, and using huge variety of different hard materials. I will focus on, again, cemented carbides and diamond. However, the hard facings, metal matrix composites, uh, tool steel, thermally stable diamond composites, uh, all are used, and there are probably more that are not on this list. And uh, this particular sector uh, relies on, on probably the greatest uh, variety of these, these materials. So, yeah, as I mentioned, it's big, um, 19 meters in diameter. And by the way, they're doing things like enhancing our infrastructure. There's the tunnel that just was, uh, was uh, completed a few years ago in, in Switzerland. Uh, 257 meter kilometer uh, long shafts um, and you can imagine trying to do that without the hard materials with just a steel pick and uh, explosives uh, like they used to do it. It's, it just would not be possible of course without, uh, without this sort of technology and this sort of technology wouldn't be able to do anything without the hard materials at the, at the cutting edge. 
Uh, it's broad. I mean, broad as in lots of applications, but also broad as in uh, we look at these. Uh, that's uh, a really nice drill bit. Um, by the way, uh, triangular drill bits or three cutter drill bits have been known quite a while in construction, and you can also uh, drill out either a square hole or chisel out a square hole uh, in your home as well. There are technologies on the market that do it on a large scale and do it on a small scale. And these picks, these planes are basically rotating, impacting into the surface, removing the material uh, or rotating on the surface to remove the, uh, the mineral material. Um, could be coal, it could be, it could be stone. And it goes deep, it goes very deep. I mean, all these blast holes um, for removing the natural stone, which are then processed later on using diamond tools, uh, are, are drilled out. Uh, all the infrastructure, horizontal uh, drilling for, for example, water pipes or, or um, sewage pipes, or even uh, running then uh, your internet cables underneath uh, the roads, uh, will be drilled with, with sort, of rock, sort of tools like this. Um, and in fact, uh, it's a very, very similar sort of design to what you can use instead of 60 centimeters in diameter, uh, 60 millimeters in diameter for, uh, for concrete as well. So, and I really would like to have shown you a video of this, but I couldn't actually get, uh, get the video. But that gives you a sort of an indication of the scales we're talking about uh, from small to large in all cases. And in particular, some of you will probably be familiar with this sort of tool, uh, handheld power tools, uh, using either rotating ratchets to, to create high frequency, low impact energy uh, impacts, or uh, electro pneumatic tools where a flying piston that's driven by, by air uh, basically hammers the, uh, the drill bit into the base material, uh, right into also into those uh, tunnels uh, where you're doing bolt holes or blast holes. And the next scale up from that, of course, would be some of these automated or semi-automated rigs. Uh, this one, by the way, is not a is not Dr. Octopus from, from Spider-Man. It actually is just a sort of time-lapse um, picture uh, showing that these things can drill in all directions. Um, and these sort of technologies are also now coming to the construction site where uh, robotic tools uh, are being guided um, by uh, 3D um, business, uh, building information uh, software. Uh, to to drill all the holes required for putting all your fastenings. If you look, if you're sitting in an office at this moment in time, look up to the ceiling. You'll see suspended ceilings. You'll see uh, your your lights. You'll see your 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 um, your water pipes for the for the sprinkler systems and so on. And uh, these sort of uh, robotic systems are going to be doing that in the future for you. And if you believe Hollywood, uh, you can also do the same thing with robotic drilling on asteroids, apparently. So yeah, tools of all sizes, small to huge, um, and using obviously drill bits of uh, respective size. So the principle, as I mentioned earlier, is the same, whether it's a, a five millimeter drill bit or a 50 centimeter or even uh, much larger than that, uh, all using these drill bits, all tipped with some form of hard material uh, to resist the wear and the, and the, and the, and the, the loads uh, that are acting on those drill bits. And of course, it's not just on solid ground. Uh, I'll make one last little picture really of uh, where this stuff is used. Uh, all the oil and gas that comes out of uh, the ground, whether it's from below sea uh, or actually on dry land, uh, has been somehow retrieved by drilling. And these drills, these large core drills are either using uh, polycrystalline diamond cutters, tungsten carbide, cemented carbide cutters, um, natural or synthetic diamonds set in the surface, thermally stable diamond composites uh, with hard facings on them and with metal matrix composite bodies and, and, and. And this, this uh, technology uh, really is pushing the limits of these hard materials and has been responsible for many of the great developments in hard materials uh, over the last uh, uh, 50 years. And of course, it's not just drilling. If you've ever been stuck on, on an autobahn in Germany or, or a, uh, an autostrada in Italy or a, or a motorway in England uh, through roadworks, you've probably seen machines like these that rip up the, uh, the asphalt uh, and uh, or uh, similar technology is used, of course, in, in the stones or in trenching. Um, 
And they're using tools like this. I showed you the one earlier. Uh, they're very nice marketing photos. It, it would be nice to have colored steel into uh, So actually, uh, somebody's always asked me, can I make a red hard metal? Um, and uh, I said, yeah, put it on your Christmas list and I'll come back to it. But these are the sort of tools we're talking about. And, and there's a variety of them uh, tipped with these uh, hard materials. And of course, on the construction side, um, very, very similar uh, sort of technologies, a steel form, a body of some form, uh, tipped with cemented carbide, with diamond, with polycrystalline diamond, they're either brazed or welded uh, or mechanically clamped um, into, the, uh, into the body, hardened uh, to within an inch of their lives uh, to survive the, uh, the very uh, difficult conditions in the application. Just check the time, I've got a few more minutes. So I'll skip over the hard metals that are used. If you're interested, you can contact Kenan, he will give you a, a copy of this presentation. Um, so a lot of these materials are actually used, and as was mentioned, uh, they are used in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the drilling field. And the choice of material depends on your mechanical properties that you require. So I'll skip over this because it's been uh, mentioned. Uh, but the, the main thing you want to look at when you're selecting the materials for these applications is, is how does it fail? Um, what do I actually really need? And I mentioned the high stresses. This is a simulation, a very simple old simulation of, of a button indenting, actually in this case in steel, um, showing stresses, compressive stresses of up to six gigapascals depending on impact energy, depending on geometry. Uh, and actually the compressive stress, the strength of this material is about that. Uh, some of the reason, one of the reasons these materials actually sometimes do survive even stresses above the uh, theoretical stress strength uh, is because of the fact that it's a dynamic and transient load and, and, and hard materials under these extremely dynamic loads can actually um, withstand stresses above their uh, failure stress in compression. However, what normally happens is that they will be impacted again and again and uh, fatigue cracks will grow and in which case, if it happens too early before wear occurs, uh, then you may want to change your design to reduce stresses, or you may want to choose, change your material uh, to uh, increase the fatigue strength. And the same is actually true. This is a very old example uh, of a polycrystalline di diamond, in fact, a multi-layer uh, so-called uh, diamond uh, insert or diamond enhanced insert, uh, so ranging from 100 uh, almost 100% uh, diamond on the, on the surface to a diamond hard metal composite, um, cemented carbon composite underneath. Again, multi-layer, very thick, a couple of mil up to a couple of millimeters thick. Uh, and these things also fatigue uh, as well. So we've said what happens with fracture. Is it fatigue? Is it monotonic fracture? Same can, can be asked about where do we have uh, in, too high a wear rate at certain locations? Do we have um, spalling? Do we have a flat abrasive wear? Do we have chemical wear? Do we have chipping? Uh, all these things will basically uh, change, uh, tell us which type of material we actually need to, to use in the application. Uh, but also the other way around, when you've got a particular um, uh, mode, uh, wear mode acting in this case, for example, this would be a sort of like fatigue based uh, micro fracturing of the carbides or underneath a, uh, uh, an abrasive uh, polishing wear to the mechanisms we showed earlier. Uh, then your choice of material actually affects the, the wear intensity, obviously the location on the drill bit as well, but uh, whether it's uh, static or whether it's got the higher peripheral speed, but um, the actual microstructure itself can uh, in theory, then also change the uh, the wear mechanism uh, from one to another. So it's it's a it's a again much like metal cutting. It's it's a complicated system. It's an interaction between the loads acting, uh, the workpiece material, which type of stone, the geometry, and the uh, hard hard material microstructure itself. Uh, it's not just a case of uh, pick tungsten carbide cobalt six percent, and you're guaranteed to have it working. This wear type. Going back to uh, chemical wear or thermochemical abrasion, um, when you've got iron, I mentioned already that tungsten carbide is soluble in iron, and therefore, uh, when you are working on rocks like this, chromite rocks, iron and chromium, uh, you're, you're tending to get a, a very different wear mechanism to a pure mechanical abrasion, which is what you get with the harder uh, silica rocks. 
Now, if they do get hot, you can actually get reaction between the silicon and the cobalt to create silicides at the surface, but uh, generally you're talking uh, mainly about uh, mechanical abrasion uh, and in one case, uh, thermochemical abrasion. And, and it's actually uh, a, 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 one of the, the things that we saw in, in the metal cutting, which is sort of cone cracking or thermal cracking, can actually occur here. So the thermal conductivity, and again, that was mentioned earlier, has been an important uh, factor. Uh, if you're repeatedly heating and cooling something, it's expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, you're going to be start introducing uh, stresses, uh, particularly if you've got high uh, and localized um, thermal gradients. And some of these gradients can be thousands of degrees per millimeter. Uh, so you're going to get uh, expansion contraction and that will lead to crack growth and actually there's a phenomena uh, which is reptile skin or snake skin depending on where you come from uh, that can actually create these these lovely patterns uh, but they're very destructive patterns uh, of course uh, in the surface regions of the cementing carbide so in this case uh, you, you may find that changing to a different uh, thermal conductivity grade uh, has more effect than actually changing the wear resist inherent wear resistance through the hardness and we know that occurs also not just in, 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 in percussive uh, systems, but also in sliding systems. Uh, this is an example from a road planer, uh, which we mentioned earlier, these asphalt road planers. And uh, in the new condition and the worn condition, uh, there is a, an opinion that um, precipitation hardening of the binder, one of the things that was mentioned earlier, uh, can actually reduce this, uh, this wear. So the left case compared to the right case, due to modifying the properties of the binder. So the last little bit, I'll just do a few minutes and I'll look at my watch. Um, if you bear with me, I know you're hungry, um, but uh, if you bear with me for the next couple of minutes, I'll just mention a few applications using the diamond cutters. And uh, in, the, in the construction site, they're probably the, the greatest variety um, although similar technologies are of course are used in stone processing. So wire sawing uh, is used for making openings, but it's also used for slabbing and cutting uh, large uh, uh, blocks of, uh, of stone out rather than blasting, which actually sometimes can waste the material. Uh, wall sawing, core drilling, polishing, uh, using either um, small, sort of 300 to 1500 micrometer uh, diamonds uh, or polycrystalline diamond. Uh, and also uh, the, the floor sawing or the asphalt cutting. You Again, you see that on the construction side on your roads. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have been sat behind these machines. These are just a few more examples. Uh, Handheld cutting, uh, either using electric um, or um, petroleum, uh, so benzene, gasoline uh, saws uh, coming soon. In fact, there are some on the market, um, battery driven. So uh, rechargeable lithium ion battery driven saws, cut off saws. Uh, and even, even chainsaws using diamond. Uh, they don't cut uh, trees down, but they will cut through brick. So these are the sort of applications you, um, where, you, where you see diamond in use. Uh, the diamond itself, uh, not all diamonds are the same. Uh, there are different sizes, there are different strengths and qualities and crystallinities. And depending on the application, uh, the thermal mechanical loads on them, uh, you would choose different grades for, for different products. Uh, right up to some these days now uh, very large uh, diamonds of, of, of in fact more than uh, 1200 microns. Uh, the yellow color by the way if you're interested is due to the nitrogen entrapment. And a diamond is only as good as what holds it together. These little particles uh, to actually remove the material uh, need to be held in, into that little segment, into that little pearl, into that little tool. Uh, and many bonds are used. I mean, cobalt was the traditionally the, the most common, um, but in the last sort of 15 to 20, 30 years, um, uh, there have been moves away to, to leaner cobalt alloys. So substituting it with, uh, in this case, iron or copper, um, or even moving to cobalt free um, grades. And some people these days are also using iron uh, and, and uh, another uh, infiltrated as well as uh, fully dense um, uh, bonds. So the thing that holds the diamond is also important. I just want to make the point here that uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of different recipes uh, out there. And in many cases, depending on the tool you're using and, and, the, and the rock or the concrete that you're actually machining. And just to give you an example of what that means, this is a, a cobalt bond, a very um, straightforward 100% cobalt bond in this, both cases with the same diamonds in the same concentration. If you've got um, 
a type of concrete that uh, breaks down into very, very fine particles and causes erosion. Um, you see basically a high speed because it's always exposing diamonds, but a low lifetime. So you can only drill 1.8 meters for every millimeter a segment. And don't forget these things are maybe uh, seven or eight millimeters of active height. Uh, whereas you go to a limestone or a quartz, which tends to fracture into larger coarser pieces, uh, you get three body, two body wear, uh, but it's, it's not as destructive. And you get a factor of 10 higher lifetime. And so finally, uh, the last class of material, polycrystalline diamond. Um, some of you might be uh, thinking, oh, that looks a lot like cemented carbide. Well, to a certain extent it is. It's, it's grains of, of uh, diamond uh, cemented or bonded in, in, a, in a matrix of cobalt. Uh, it can actually be other materials as well, but generally it's, it's cobalt bond. Uh, and there is some intergrowth between the diamonds. Uh, but to a much lesser extent than we saw in the in the lovely uh, 3D reconstruction earlier. Uh, there is some diamond-diamond bonding and you can actually leach away and, and remove this cobalt. And that's done uh, on a standard in the industry these days for thermally resistant uh, polycrystalline diamond cutters. Uh, and the material might not have as high a mechanical strength, but it has a much, much higher uh, thermal mechanical strength. So the uh, the resistance to, to fracture at higher temperatures is high. And they're used in these uh, particular um, products, as we, as we saw them earlier, these, these drill bits, using these sort of polycrystalline diamond cutters with a thick diamond layer uh, on these cemented carbide substrates. And with that, um, I'd like to say you know, thank you to, um, to the companies uh, for, the, for the images. Um, they are used for, for non-profit uh, pur educational purposes and fair use. Uh, the sources are there, you can look at them. But the most important thing um, from this one is I hope you've enjoyed the, the presentation, learned a little bit, uh, and I'd like to dedicate it to uh, a giant of the industry who passed away just uh, less than a month ago, uh, Ken Brooks. And on the bottom left, you see the, the productivity curve. He was there in the industry uh, just after, you know, just post-war. Uh, where really the modern world as we know it in terms of productivity started due to these hard materials and he was a pioneer uh, within that in the UK in, in the 1950s and spent nearly 70 years uh, supporting our industry and uh, may you rest in peace Ken. Thank you very much everyone and um, if you have questions and you're still awake uh, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you Stephen. Uh... And uh, it's uh, something that I would like to thank you for uh, as having a rip after Kenneth. Uh, uh, I had the chance of meeting him in Maastricht, uh, as although I'm rather very new in, 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 in the world of uh, PM, uh, so uh, it's a very big loss for the PM community. So let's just say rip after him. Uh, mm -hmm. We have some a few questions. I would like to go one by one. Uh, okay. The first one is um, from Aladdin. He says uh, he sees as he saw a slight uh, a relation between the type of diamond and the pow power of the tool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can you elaborate the relation between the power of the tool and the type of diamond? Yeah, we, we just to make a point, we, we, test, uh, we test diamond with what's called a friability test. You put a certain amount of diamond in a capsule with a large steel ball, you shake it until they start to fracture. And you measure it, it's called the, the friability or the toughness index. And what, what that uh, does is, is, is give you an indication of how, uh, if you like, fatigue resistant the material is. And so what we do is, is if you've got a handheld tool where you can't put a lot of pressure on it, uh, if you put a strong diamond in there, it would gradually wear and wear and wear until it became sort of dulled and rounded, and then it wouldn't cut. So in, in those low power cases, you want a, you want a weaker diamond. Uh, if you're um, using, um, for example, uh, systems that use mild percussion, so they're actually using diamond segments and, and diamonds of uh, 500 microns to a millimeter in size in, in impact systems, uh, you of course then want a very strong material. So it's got to be a high toughness, um, but also a high compressive strength. So you want good crystallinity. You probably want a, a, a sort of more octahedral diamond rather than a, 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 a more elongated diamond, which could fracture because of uh, local stresses. 
similarly, if it's going to be hot, so if you're drilling dry uh, or you're coring dry or limited water, you want one with a thermal, uh, good thermal properties. So it has to have less uh, material uh, inclusion. So the metallic inclusions, as they get hot, they expand and they can actually fracture the diamond. So that's the thermal toughness index. So again, depending on what you're doing, you, you require different sizes, different shapes, different strengths, different purities, uh, different crystallinities. And, uh, and you can actually control the growth uh, of these uh, diamonds so that you get growth in particular directions, whether you want it in the hard direction, the soft direction um, for, for certain properties. And, and they're actually sorted by shape and strength uh, at the diamond manufacturers. So if you know, if you. You know, if you know the application, then you have a chance of uh, picking the right diamond. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is from Bram. Is there a difference in performance between natural and synthetic diamonds? Can the synthetic ones be tuned for other properties? Uh, they, they can, they can also be doped, of course, because we, uh, we um, basically manufacture them from uh, either, either microscopic seed crystals or through pure, uh, through pure growth out of a solution. Uh, you can actually tailor them. Uh, the, so the industrial, the synthetic industrial diamonds um, are, are, are much broader in terms of uh, their, their mechanical and in, actually in electrical properties. One of the things you can do is dope them with boron, for example, uh, to, uh, to make them thermally conductive, or you can actually control the conductivity. Uh, similarly, the nitrogen content does that. Uh, you can control the, the metallic inclusion style in them. You can even color them. You, you put your chrome in, your cobalt in, you actually get your pink diamonds, your blue diamonds, and so on. So, yeah, we, we, we can do a lot more with, with synthetic diamonds, not just grown in high pressure, high temperature conditions, but also um, through the chemical vapor deposition uh, or even the um, uh, either, either through microwave assisted or, or um, hot filament, for example, through the gas phase. Uh, there, there, are, there are different ways of, of creating different diamonds. A diamond is not a diamond. It's a, it's a family of materials these days, and they're highly engineered. Thank you. Our next question is from Hozik. Uh, are concentration gradient materials uh, produced using powder metallurgy techniques better than surface treated or coated materials for wear resistance purposes? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, if you're talking about coated, you, you're generally limited in the thickness of, of the coating that you apply. Um, now, if you're using it through a, or, or producing it through a pressing uh, method where you can put multi layers in, um, systems that could, could maybe graduate it over three, four, five different layers, uh, obviously you can put exactly what materials you need where you need them. If you do it through one of the, uh, the sintering or post sintering cobalt migration style uh, methods, you can also get very deep gradients. You can get, again, millimeters in, in depth. You might not need that. Um, you might only need 100 microns, for example, uh, or, or three, 400 microns of, of enhanced wear resistance on the surface. An example being those drill bits for the, the construction where they're drilling holes for mechanical anchors. If the hole is too big, uh, the anchor can't grip. If it's too small, you can't put it in the hole. So you, you have a very small tolerance of wear. And these things, maybe once they're 0.3 millimeters smaller on gauge, you have to throw them away anyway. So you wouldn't need to do a mega uh, large uh, gradient. Uh, but similarly, a, a 10 micron coating wouldn't work either. So again, horses for courses. OK, so I would like to be as quick as possible. A short question. Uh, in one slide, uh, Heidberg sees a mentioning of tungsten carbide to carbon coating. Where is it used? Uh, this uh, tungsten carbide, carbide coating, um, or tungsten carbide tungsten coating, that very thick um, so-called hardide coating. It's, it's a, a, I'm, I'm not endorsing the company, but it's the only one uh, I know that actually does this. Uh, they, they're used uh, again in some way. Uh, they, because it's a, it's a process that you can make in CVD in huge parts, uh, it's, it's a wear resistant coating for, uh, for, for applying on very large things like metal forming and so on. If you're interested, uh, I can give you the, the, uh, the website. Okay. Uh, okay, I go on. Uh, question from Arno. How, uh, that's a general question. How would you estimate the risk of government restrictions on cobalt usage because of health risks? risks? <laughs> Yeah. Maybe commercial, I don't know. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, obviously, the occupation exposure, the, the, the toxicology um, issues, the carcinogenic, the mutagenic. 
you know, it's it's gonna at some point. Um, of course, it's it's uh, the manufacturer using cobalt is going to be even more difficult than it is today. Although we have extremely high standards, and maybe Jose can make make a point on this. Uh, I think it would be difficult to say from one day or one year to the next you have to ban everything with cobalt in because the world would grind to a halt. Uh, we do not have an alternative at this moment, and therefore, I think the economics of it. Uh, we don't want to go back to. Uh, to the steam age uh, or the stone age uh, in terms of technology for, for metal cutting and, and so on. So I think it would be extremely foolish to to, uh, to ban cobalt immediately. I think we're all working towards replacements so and we're all working towards reducing and, and improving our manufacturing methods. Um, but even, to be honest, even if legislation came in tomorrow, I don't think it could, uh, the economics outweigh to a certain extent the, the the other disadvantages. So there's going to be some form of trade-off, I think, in, in, in usage. You know, it's a bit like, like the petrol, the, the, the internal combustion engine. You know, at some point it will fade away, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. Okay, Maybe thank you. Know. And we have uh, Jose again on the stage. Uh, so I think uh, we have done so far so good. This is the end of our uh, webinar. Thanks again to all our speakers, Jose and Steven, for their nice presentations. And I hope to see all of you uh, in 2021 within our next uh, events, either online or hopefully physical. I don't know. <laughs> I hope so too. Thank you, Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Thank you everyone for your attention. Yeah. Okay. To see Thank you. The end, uh, there's, still, there's still over 80 people, even though we had 100 at most. But that's not bad. We only lost uh, 20 over the course of my uh, oh, fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Anyway, uh, for la one last uh, reminder, I will s uh, distribute the presentations to the attendees. Uh, this is asked a lot. So thank you all. Have a nice day. Have a great day. Uh, See you. Ken, Kenan, yeah? okay. if, there are, if there are any questions from the participants, they can reach us anytime also, because I see that somebody are posting questions that come later probably. Okay. Yes, of course. Uh, of, of course, I will take care of it. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much, everybody. So Thank you. See you. Take Bye. care, Steve. Take care, Kenan. You Thank take you care, everyone. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.